<clears throat> That's true, Debbie, I did. I find it very difficult to understand how you can fall asleep during Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Then I'll explain, Debbie. I fell asleep during Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony bores me shitless. <laughs> you are joking. <clears throat> are you joking? I'm not sure when you are joking. I think you must always be joking when you are being coarse. I'm never joking when I'm being coarse. I don't like it when you are coarse. You must be having a really bad time of it. You should listen to Beethoven carefully, Mitch. My favorite is the Eighth Symphony. But you should listen especially to the Ninth. Beethoven wrote it in his last years. It is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written. You should listen to it, Major. Is it the same length as number five, or has he got older, did he write shorter? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are joking. But you must listen to it, Major. That's why I brought these recordings, so that you should know with whom you are dealing. I don't know who I'm dealing with. Do another, do another band here at once. A guy by the name of Dix Dixon. Small time alto sax. Not bad, not good, not bad. I used to play a little one night stand around Illinois and Michigan. But the house he, he owned, he and the band used to stay, burned down. Lost everything. Well, almost everything. <coughs> but I got it. You know how? Because there's, there's always one question that the guilty can't answer. You get yourself a sign writer, I mean, you write it real big. There's always one question the guilty can't answer. In Dix's case, how come Dix, everybody lost everything except you? You got your clothes, you got your sacks, how come? We bet you couldn't answer. Tell them who you got. Know the bookies. You understand what I'm talking about, Andy? He burned down his own house to get the insurance money. We used to call that Jewish lightning. How many did I have to see before the big guys did? Just one. Helmut Broder. Second violinist, 1935 to the present. Also, there's a request from Wiesbaden that you see a Mrs. Tamara Sachs. I have talked to her on the telephone. She will be coming at 2 o'clock. Anything from Wiesbaden got to be bad news. What's this Mrs. Sachs woman? She wouldn't say. Oh, and Major, a young officer put his head around the door a moment ago, saw that you were asleep, and then went away. Who was it? I don't know. I have never seen him before. And two other messages. Captain Vernon, he was a major. Colonel Volkov will not be attending. I leave. <laughs> Nothing from the bridge. No. So where's, uh, where's this young officer now? I don't know. He came and went. We'll go find him. We have <laughs> Lieutenant Wilson reporting to Major Arnold, sir. For my sakes, I hate that shit. Cut it out. <laughs> Name's Steve. <laughs> <It's> yours. <laughs> David. David Wilson. Who are you? I've taken over from Captain Greenwood. I'm your new liaison officer with Allied Intelligence. Well, what happened to Hank? Captain Greenwood was ordered to know, but it seems they needed more interpreters at the trial. <laughs> You're dealing with the British now, huh? Yes, sir! You call me sir again, and I'm going to make you listen to Beethoven. <laughs> Coffee? Black. Have you met, um, met that Limey major yet? You want to talk like he's got ice cubes in his mouth? I can tell if he's speaking German or English. Major Richards. Yeah, yeah, Alan Richards. I talked to him this morning, but he was just rushing off to an urgent meeting. Urgent meeting? Hinkle Archive. Yes. Do you know what's in the Hinkle Archive? No. If it's important, do you think, uh, think the British are going to share it with their allies? He said he'd call and let you know. He said he was very disappointed. He wanted to be here today, especially today. Where are you from? I was born here. Not more than in Hamburg. I escaped in 34. My parents sent me to live with my uncle in Philadelphia. They were to follow, but they delayed and delayed. 
They did not follow. My family name is Maya. But that doesn't sound well to me either, so my uncle changed it to Wills. You hear that, Emmy? David here was born in Hamburg. Yes, I heard. I'm sorry about your parents. Now, this is Emmy Stroke. She records the interviews for us. She's been with me a week. She's a good German. The father was in the plot against Adolf. But what kind of intelligence officer are you? David, you're supposed to ask a question. You should have asked, how do we know that she didn't report her father for being in the plot against Adolf? Isn't that what you should have asked, Emmy? Emmy's all right. We checked it out. You're okay, aren't you, Emmy? <coughs> should I see if Mr. Rob is here? It's after nine. When I say so, Emmy. When I say so. I like to keep waiting to get some sweat. Which is a kindness in this way, wouldn't you say? I expect Mr. Rob is in Asia. She won't call me Steve, David. And she's so correct. And she likes books and poetry. She's crazy about Beethoven, aren't you, Emmy? You like Beethoven, David? Yes. I thought you looked a little funny when I corrected you. And I suppose you admire me for some. What? This is like a criminal investigation, David. Musicians, musicians, doctors, lawyers, butchers, clerks, they're all the same. I saw Bergen Dust two days after it was liberated. I know what I'm talking about. I've seen things with these eyes. Do you know what I'm talking about, David? Yes. You think of your parents, don't think of musicians. It's the band leader we're after, the big guy. He's the one we want to nail. You know what I call him, David? I call him a piece of shit. I call them all pieces of shit. Yes, but uh, Captain Greenwood said our evidence against him is difficult to come by. Yeah, let's talk about that. You see this guy in the Now, here's how we do it. This is my show. I ask the question. You want to ask a question, you raise a finger, but he can't see it, and I'll say yay or nay. Understood? Yes. All right. Now, let me explain the technique. First, tell the shit that's why we're here. And we ask two questions. Just two questions. First, anything that comes to mind. Uh, how do you feel? Get enough to eat, need any cigarettes, so on. Just real friendly. You know? Second, you say, I noticed from your questionnaire that you were never a member of the party. Is that right? Oh, absolutely right. Never remember the part. And wait. Just wait. Say nothing. And talk. <laughs> you're hot. You're going to hear. You're going to hear what a great guy the band leader is, and how he defied Adolf and Herman and Joseph. And they always managed to slip in that damn baton story. What's the baton story? <laughs> <clears throat> How many have I seen, Emmy? Twenty-eight. Wait, so this guy, this guy, Rhoda. Rhoda. Rhoda's gonna be the twenty-ninth. You're gonna hear the Tom story for the first time. I'm gonna hear it for the twenty-ninth. They, they, they always manage to find out Emmy's last name, don't they, Emmy? Stolba, they say. Any relation to Jakob Stolba? My father says it. Oh, a great man, a great hero. David, what they're trying to do. Trying to cover the band leader in roses so they don't come out smelling just as sweet. It's a little tough to smell sweet when you crawl through the raw sewage. I was an insurance <coughs> claims assessor before the war. What were you in? College. Hmm. When all this is over? I'd like to teach history. History. Be a good memory to teach history, don't you? Know, all those dates and in battle. You got a good memory? Not bad. I mean, I got, a, I got a terrific memory. I've been examined by psychologists for my memory, nothing else. <laughs> I've got what they call total recall. I remember everything. It is a curse. Believe me, it's a curse. But uh, I'm bad with names. You know, it's what the shrinks call selecting. My recall is not too good, but pretty good. Insurance. Insurance. I was trained by a guy named Lou O'Donnell. Kind of a Jim Cagney type. Pushy, smart, persistent. Oh my God, I that guy persistent. Lou taught me to look out 
of what he called repetitive evidence. Because 99 times out of 100, it's covered in a conspiracy and fraud. So what is that? I think um, whole orchestra, say uh, 100, 120 guys or so, could be orchestrated. I don't know. I, I guess it's possible. Yeah, me too. I guess it's possible. <laughs> All right, and let's get this going in here. You sit over there, okay? But remember, that's why I say two questions and you wait. Let's see. Mr. Hubbard, what's your Sit down, Ellis. understand why you're here. This is a preliminary investigation into Wilhelm Kirchbauer, a former Prussian privy counselor who's banned, banned from public life under control counsel directive number 24. He was applied to come before the Tribunal of Artists of the Denazification Commission. Understand? Yes. All right. What we're interested in is just what he was up to from 1933 to the end of the war. Now, I've got your file. Thomas Alfred Roda, second violinist, Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra since 1935. What's that mean, Helmut, second violinist? It means I wasn't good enough to be the first violinist. <laughs> Mind you, you have to be pretty good just to be the second violinist in, in the Berlin Philharmonic, even if I say so myself. Well, also, it says here that um, she never joined the party, is that right? Me? Never. Never. I hate it down. Believe me, please. I know not everyone says they've been ever members of the Nazi party, but in my case it is absolutely 100% true. I am a Catholic, a convert. It would have been totally against my conscience. It is difficult to explain what it was like. Terror. That's what you felt from morning to night. Even asleep, you felt terror. In the early days, of course, we were all in opposition. I'm talking about 33, 34. I, I shudder when I think of the things I said. I used to tell jokes. And I hit the jokes. And it's well known for my hand, I hit the jokes. Here's an example of a famous hand I hit the joke in 33, 34. A couple of Jews. One says to the other, I have two bits of news for you. One good, one bad. But the good news, Hitler is dead. But the bad news, it isn't true. <laughs> want to know about Dr. Furtwangler. But he is without doubt one of the most courageous people it has been my honor to know. But we all acknowledge he is a god among musicians. He, in my humble second violinist opinion, of the greatest conductor alive. But it's true, I have never played at the Tosca Lady, but I've heard his recordings and the, the motion. It is not the same. But, uh, Tuscanini is a metronome. <laughs> Dr. Ferdinand is an artist. He is unquestionably a genius without equal. Is it true you're going to interview him today? And in so far as rumors, I heard he hears things often tonight. If rumors were edible, we'd all be well fed. If I may say so, I hope 
focusing to it is properly guarded. Uh, there are so many crazy people about it. Uh, it comes from some terrible times, uh, but man can do more. Here's something that may be of interest to you. It was on a special occasion, I think, that the Second Winter Assistance Program, an old Beethoven concert in 35. Uh, it, it was suddenly announced that Hitler himself was going to attend. And you can imagine, the Meister was outraged. We didn't want to know how angry he was. He, the ritual would have never after the rain in his dressing room would talk how outraged he was. That's what he do. He could have tell Hitler to attend. Fathers and Nazis salute, absolutely refuse to give it. Uh, now, this I heard him say, but my own ears, I heard him say, I don't have to acknowledge him at all. Over and over again, I heard him say this. How could he avoid giving it a salute when Satan himself was in the audience? What would he up with the solution? I said, Maestro, why not the limited economy right hand? Here you will be sitting in the front row, and if you enter with the baton in the right hand and try to get the salute, it will look like you're going to poke his eyes out. <laughs> uh, he was very grateful to me for that suggestion. And so he entered the volume. On his right hand, which meant he couldn't give the salute. But could return immediately to us, and even while the audience was still applauding, made the signal to begin. They had to do something in confidence. After the concert, I did something disreputable. I stole with the pond. So when I saw the way back, I I still have it. I should have brought it to show you. I find you. It was always a joke in the orchestra, the, the maestro's baton. His technique is very eccentric. He waves, he sways, he jiggles. God knows when you're meant to come in. <laughs> His downbeat was always the subject to jokes. Other musicians used to ask us. How do you know when to play the first part of the heroic? When the maestro's baton reaches the eighth spike, the right, the third set on his shirt, we start. How do you know when to play the semi quavers of the night? When the maestro enters, we walk around our chair three times. Sit down, count to ten, and begin. Oh, then we lose our patience. <laughs> Am I going to pass for you, uh, uh, for a Strobe. Strobe? Any relation to a kind of young Strobe? My father. <coughs> it is an honor to be in your presence, Strobe and Strobe. Your father was a true patriot. Man of God, great grace part in the future. I want to categorically say that Wilhelm Verdrang did not serve the regime. So when the orchestra served the regime. Now forgive me if I make a philosophical observation. Wilhelm Verdrang is a symbol to all the world of what is great in music and culture. And the Nazis needed him. They needed him to make themselves respectable. Do you have a question for Helen David? Yes. Uh, there's a photograph, isn't there, Mr. Roda, of Dr. Flintbaum was shaking hands with Hitler. How do you explain that? But that was the program I was talking about. Uh, the old Beethoven concert when the Maestro entered with the baton in his right hand to avoid giving the salute. But as I said, Hitler was sitting in the front row, and at the end of the concert, he suddenly got up, came on the platform, and offered the maestro his hand. Well, and he took it. Well, what else could he do? That's all there was to it. I was there. I witnessed it. And it was.
was a calculated act, not spontaneous at all, because they wanted him on their side. And of course they did. And so there were photographers there. What else would he do? He simply had to shake Satan's hand. That's all there is to it. And he did not conduct the Meistersanger at the party congress in Nuremberg in 1935. He played it the evening before the congress. The music is quite separate from the politics. That is a Meister's creed. The politics and the arts must be kept separate. And the same, and the same is true with the devil's birthday. It was the evening of the 19th they were not and here. <laughs> Usually on such occasions, he had this doctor's diagnosing his spondylitis, uh, an inflammation <coughs> of the uh, back and neck, common in conductors, and very, very painful. But on Satan's birthday in 1942, Jervos got to the doctor's first and got his back. And don't forget, please. The Maestro had to preach to Switzerland last year just before the war ended because he learned that the Gestapo were about to arrest him. Uh, this is a good and honest man and the greatest conductor alive. Mr. Lord, you only joined the Berlin Philharmonic in 1935. Where were you before that? I was a member of another orchestra in Mannheim. But in Berlin in 1935, several vacancies arose. I auditioned. Yes, Dr. Fertig, the person was very good to the Jews. He helped a lot of Jews escape. The Jews who could no longer be members of the orchestra, although he tried to retain them for as long as he possibly could. His secretary, but the Geisner, was a Jewess. He relied on her so much. And the end, he helped her escape too, uh, to England, uh, I believe. But was she secretary to Sir Thomas Beecham? Uh, he is also a conductor. Uh, but he is not Dr. Fertlinger. How old is Hans Hinkle? That's what I asked. I see we understand. The question, Helm, isn't it? How about giving it an answer? How could I know such a, a man? Hans Hinkle is in the Ministry of Culture. How could I miss such a man? Uh, they say he has a, an archive, files, records. Uh, uh, do you know what's in the archive major? Just going to ask you that, Helen. He? I don't see that. I have heard that there are letters from people swearing allegiance to the, the regime. Well, that's what I heard. And in my personal second violinist opinion, Hans Hinkle is a very low-level functionary. His archive would have nothing of interest. Hey, you go, Helmut. That's it. Get out of here, Helmut. Evidence, hard or soft, doesn't matter. 
But I've got the one question that's going to find impossible to answer. Dear God in heaven, it is you! There's a woman attacking Dr. Footbottle! This is an outbreak! Hey, get out of here! Who the hell do you I think have you are? I haven't What are you doing? Who any idea who's sitting out there? We only have what Mangler is sitting out there. Let me go call her. You're crazy! You're all crazy! Yeah, you don't know what you are doing! Call her! You can't do this! You can't do this! I'm sorry. When I saw him, I lost all control. Everything went out of my mind. Why don't you sit down while I sit in bed again? No, no. I have to talk to you. Are you in charge? Who are you? My name is Tamara Sachs. Isn't this the one I'm supposed to see it too? Please sit down, Miss Sachs. Mrs. Sachs, I have something of importance to tell you about. We're going to talk about Okay, let me get us all some coffee. Please, sir, sit down over here, Mrs. Sachs. I told them about it in this spot. They said I must tell you. Then I heard you were interviewing him today. I have material evidence to give. Yeah, well, let's wait till my secretary comes back and she You see, I'm trying to find some proof that my husband, Walter Sachs, existed. I think Dr. Hortmangler may be able to provide this proof. I've been waiting since the early hours. Then when I actually saw him, could he come in, please? No, he can't come in. Was your husband a friend of his? No. My husband, Walter Sachs, was the most promising young pianist of his generation. Well, they're colleagues, perhaps. No, that's just a point. Dr. Fitbongo spoke to me. He wants to know how long he is to be kept waiting. Emmy, you go back out there and you tell him in these words, these exact words, mind you. You're going to wait until Major Arnold's ready to see you or until hell freezes over, whichever takes longer. You got that, Emmy? And don't say anything else. Can't okay? he come in, please? Go on, Emmy. Come back in here and take notes. I'll do the coffee. Tomorrow, how do you take your coffee? Is there cream and sugar? It isn't the American, though. say Mrs. Sachs will be treated as confidential. But I don't want it treated as confidential. I want the world to know. When I asked you if your husband and Dr. Feuerbaumler were colleagues, you said, no, that's just the point. What did you mean exactly? I can't remember what I wanted to say now. It's gone out of my mind. I have a list here. Why did I bring this list? Perhaps it would help if I asked you questions. I think Dr. Fortwangler is the only man who can give me proof that my husband existed. How could he do that? I've not been well. For some time now I've not been well. They took Walter away. We were in Paris at the time. I returned here to be near my mother. My father was with the Army of Occupation in Denmark. I shall be 33 next birthday. Look at my hair. I am trying to return to France, but the French authorities are not helpful. I want to die in Paris. It was the only place we were happy. Tomorrow, why don't you tell us where you're staying? We can get a doctor to tell me. 
I was a philosophy student in 1932 at the university here in Berlin. I was 18 years old. I was taken to a recital in a private house to hear a young pianist. The house belonged to Dr. Myra Samuel, who was a very famous piano teacher at the time. The young pianist was Walter Sachs, aged 17. A year younger than me. I fell in love with him just listening to him play. <coughs> he was very beautiful. We were married. He was a Jew. I am not. My maiden name was Mueller. Just tell us how Dr. Kurt Wang was figures into all this. It's an outbreak what you're doing, you know. What are we doing? Behaving like that. What, what, what happened to your husband, Mrs. Sachs? He died! In Auschwitz. That's in Poland. I don't know the exact date. And Dr. Kurt Wang. We were tipped off that my husband was to be arrested within the week. He had no money, no influence. We went rushing around to Myra Samuel. We asked for help. She said she would see what she could do. <coughs> that evening, she sent a message. He had such and such an address at midnight. It was a cellar. Once a night club had closed down. We were terrified. We knocked. Dr. Samuel opened the door and she admitted us. There was only one other person there. This is William Fort Baylor, she said. He will listen to you play. <clears throat> there was an old upright piano, the Beckstein, uh, the tune. Walter sat down and played no more than three minutes of the Volstein Sonata. Dr. Fortbanger suddenly stood, he said. I will try to help. And left quickly. The very next day, we received an official permit to leave. We took the train to Paris, and we were happy that Walter began to make a name for himself. Then, in June 1940, they took Walter away. I'm not Jewish. Finally, the name uh, was new. Yes, yes. I had this list. I, I remember now. These are some of the people that he helped. The Jews and non-Jews he helped. Uh, Ludwig Nisch, Felix Lieber, Joseph Kreitz, Arnold Schomburg. Dozens. And dozens of people that he helped. He helped Walter Sachs, my husband, undoubtedly the finest young pianist of his generation. I'll find out more. I'll keep asking. I'll write letters. I'll give evidence because I know what you want to do. You want to destroy him, isn't that true? You want to burn him at the stake. You're just trying to find out the truth. How can you find out the truth? 
There is no such thing. Who's true? The victors? The vanquished? The victims that did Who's true? No, no. You have but only one duty, and that is to determine who is good and who is evil. That's all there is to it. To destroy one good man now is to make the future impossible. Don't behave like that, please. I know what I am talking about. The good are few and far between. You must honor the good, especially if they are few, like Dr. Hortwanger. And the children of the good, like Fromein Stroll. Gee, are you really famous in this city? I want to see you, please. I want to know if he remembers Walter. Mm. I want to know. If he remembers that night, both we'll played the opening at the Boss Time Sonata on the afternoon next time, not right piano in the Berlin cell. Tomorrow, not today. We've got to talk to your benefactor first, you see. You're going to set fire to him, aren't you? Come on, tomorrow. I'm just an investigating officer. I don't have the power to set fire to anyone, even if I wanted to, which I don't believe in. Now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have Emmy here take you out the back way. She's going to get Sergeant Benelli to find you transport wherever you want to go, but I want you to have this. Okay. This is my number. And I want you to call me if you need anything. And I mean anything. Food, cigarettes, medicine. Okay? And how does that sound? It sounds as if you're going to burn it. Let me take Lamar out the back. Would you like this, please? Mm -hmm. I have it. You keep it, Tamara, and the copy, but thanks a lot. <laughs> We're going to nail him. We're going to nail that bastard good and proper. <laughs> but you don't see it, do you? No. I don't see how to list the people whom he's supposed to have helped. David, David, last month I was in Vienna. I had with me this Austrian driver, Max, his name was, and he dug time in the camps. We were watching these Viennese cleaning up a bomb damage, scavenging through the rooms, looking for, for food, for blood ends, anything that they could find. And I looked at those people and said, just think, just think, Max, a million of these people came out to welcome Adolf the day he entered the city. A million of them. Look at them now. And Max says, oh no, Major, not these people. They were all at home hiding Jews in their attics. You get the point, David? The point is, they're all full of shit. If I may say so, Major, I think Dr. Furtwein is in a different category here. He is, after all, one of the most famous conductors. Yeah, let, me, let me tell you another story, David. Before I got this assignment, I was at Ike's headquarters, interrogating prisoners of war. And they called me in. He said, Steve, you ever heard of Wilhelm Furtbangler? No. How about uh, Toscanini? I said, yeah, sure. So it's Tukowski? Yeah. Old guy, white hair, looks like Harpo Marx's grandpa. <laughs> That's the one we said. Well, this, this Furtbangler is probably bigger than both of them. So I said, oh, I get it. He's a band leader. He started laughing. <laughs> they really are. He said, well, Maybe more than that. In this neck of the woods, he's kind of like uh, Bob Hope and Betty Grable rolled into one. I said, geez, I think I've never even heard of it. You know what they said next? They said, Steve, that's why we get the job. Who's they, Major? Who's they at work? Who's the they that sent for you? Who's the they that gave you this assignment? No, the they, they will just do my job. I mean, you got to remember, we're dealing with decadence here. I mean, that's all you've got to remember. You've seen things with these Danger. eyes. Steve, please, come on. Don't treat me as if I'm not on your side. Well, I do that, David, because I don't even know which side you're on. I think that's insulting. You're tough. Hank Greenwood made me feel the same way. He was interested in 
true evidence, justice. I'm interested in nailing the bastard. Did Nellie get her transport? Yes. <sighs> All right. This is it. I mean, let's get in here. Same rules of engagement. Guys here, two questions, and we wait. I'm going to wait for this. Dr. Wilhelm von Bande. Sit down, well. Sit here. <coughs> Steve Arnold, it's David Wills. You should understand why you're here. You're automatically banned from public life under Control Council Directive Number 24. We're checking into your case before it appears in front of the Tribunal of Artists at the Denazification Commission. I have already been cleared by the denazification tribunal in Austria. What they do in Austria, that interests me one little bit. Okay. Now, have your questionnaire here. Gustav, Heinrich, Ernst, Martin, Wilhelm, Kurt Born, Berlin, January 1886, orchestral conductor. You say here you never joined the party. Well, that is correct. Aren't you going to tell us how you had to keep your baton in your right hand so you wouldn't have to salute and poke Adolf's eyes out? Aren't you going to tell us about being Prussian privy counselor? How's that happen to a non-party member? I received a telegram from Herman Gap, who was Prime Minister of Prussia in 1933, telling me that he had made me a privy counselor. I was not given the opportunity either to accept or to refuse. After the dreadful events of November 1938, the violent attacks on Jews, I stopped using the title. Great. Great you stopped using that title. What about what about Vice President of the Chamber of Music to use that title? Did you? Well, but I suppose uh, Joseph just sent you a telegram saying, Dear Mr. Vice President. No, I don't believe that General sent me a telegram. I was, I was simply told that in a letter, I think. I don't remember exactly. Joseph and Herman were sure he's in the honors on it. One of them makes you a Prussian privy counselor, the other one makes you vice president of the Chamber of Music, and you weren't even a member of the party. How do you explain that? There was a constant battle between Gables and drawing as to which one of them would control Nazi culture. People like me, because Strauss, we were caught in the middle, we were caught. I resigned from the Chamber of Music at the same time that I resigned as musical director of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra in 1934. What was that? Why did you resign, Dr. Fritz They came to power in January 1933. In April, I wrote an open letter to the newspaper condemning what they were doing to music, making these distinctions between Jews and non-Jews. For my part, the only divide in music is the artist between good and bad. Great artists are rare, though. And no country can afford to do without them unless it wishes to damage its cultural life irrevocably. But I also said that, that like, uh, Rudolf uh, uh, like, uh, uh, Carl like, uh, Max Reinhardt, uh, I may mention artists, I don't remember now, they, they must be allowed 
to serve Iraq. He had this country. And then you resigned. No, not in those were the early days. The matter came to a head when Goebbels decided to ban Mattis, the painter, and outlaw by all means. They called it Julian Effective Dead. Bolshevik music or some such nonsense. Once again, I wrote through the newspapers. Once again, I condemned them. And Goebbels retaliated in a speech in which he denounced people that he called uh, my disloyalty to the regime. That's when I resigned. I resigned everything. I simply withdrew from public life and went back to composing, which I had long felt was my true vocation. After much toing and throwing under some of my girls, he told me that I could leave this country if I wanted to. But under no condition would I ever be allowed to return. <laughs> so there would be a victory for me. I believe that you have to fight for it inside, not in the top. And he also demanded that I acknowledge Hitler as solely responsible for cultural policy. But that was a fact. He was the sole author, but it seemed pointless to me to deny it. So, in return, I demanded that I be allowed to stay in this country to work, but I would not be obliged to accept any official position, nor would I have to conduct at any state functions. I long believed that art and politics should have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Really? Why did you conduct one of the Nuremberg rallies? I did not conduct that the rally. I conducted the evening before the rally. <laughs> Sounds like a small print on one of our insurance policies. Well, right? yeah, I had nothing to do with the rally. What about April 19, 1942? Eve of Adolf's 53rd birthday. A night in celebration you conducted for Adolf, didn't you? Now, was that in keeping with your views that art and politics should have nothing to do with each other? Right. That was a different mind. Why that? Well, I was tricked. Okay. I was in Vienna. They were in the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven with the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. When I received word, received word from a very from girls that I had to conduct, but it was bad. And always I managed to wriggle really out such invitations by claiming a clarification of illness and so on. And I was fortunate that all that I'm sure I could control. Vienna, he said, because he would do anything he could uh, to thwart his wishes. Uh, he had often helped me in the past by saying, for example, that he had prior claim on my services. Okay. But, but on this particular occasion, uh, he was got to my doctors before me, frightened them off. But Chirac was threatened and bullied and then he gave in. So, I had no alternative but to conduct the Hitler. And believe me, I, I knew, I, I compromised, I deeply repented. Sure, Sure, Now, is that the, uh, is that the same Balder von Schirach, the Nazi youth leader, who sent me a dock at Nuremberg, uh, charged with crimes against humanity or trial for his life? That's how you tricked him. That sounds like a trick to me. Well, to the best of my knowledge, that is what happened. The trick was, that the pressure was brought to bear before I had an opportunity to maneuver. And believe me, the regime knew as well as I did that I, I had not found my knee. Doesn't sound like that. Sounds like you made a deal. I made no deal. My only concern was in preserving the quality of music that I believed to be my mission. Remember a young pianist named Walter Sachs? No. Young Jewish pianist? No. He was a student of, what's that teacher's name? Amira Sandel. Yeah, I don't mind Sandel. You don't remember this pupil of hers playing a piano for you in a cellar in Berlin? Yeah, they did. What was it? Walter Sachs. 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 His widow attacked you a few minutes ago. What well, no one attacked me. In the waiting room. That woman didn't attack me. She was trying to kiss my hand. All oh, right. <laughs> I guess that's because she was grateful to you. See, you helped her husband. You got him a permit to go to Paris. I was just wondering, what 
How'd you go about that? How'd you do it? But I don't remember. There are so many. You've heard about all those folks you've helped, but I'm just wondering how you did it. Did you, uh, did you call someone you knew or what? I may have. As I say, I don't remember. Well, let me see if I can remind you. You picked up the phone and you made a call. Hi, Adolph. Willem speaking. Say, listen, old pal, I got this Jew boy pianist that needs you to help. He got, needs a permit to get to Paris. Oh, that's great, Adolph. Well, shall I have him pick it up or will you send it round? Well, God bless you, Adolph, and I'll fucking get her. <laughs> now, maybe you called Herman and Joseph. You see, I think you made a deal. I think you got real close to the devil and his cohorts. You were so close to him, you were in the same shit house as they were. You could Emmy. Emmy, how can you take notes with your goddamn finger? Emmy! This is Emmy Strobel, though. She's a very sensitive girl. So, how many Jews do you think you helped, Will? I have no idea. Maybe, huh? I am not going to defend myself by trumping numbers. May I ask a question? Sure. When will my case be heard by the tribunal? Yes, it's as good as mine. I recently visited your colleagues in Wiesbaden. The American occupation authorities, those charged with assisting in my defense. Ah, they were very polite, very helpful. They told me This isn't Wiesbaden, and I'm not here to defend you. I need to work. I need to make my living. I've been living off the generosity of my friends. Well, these things take time. Well, then why do you say, please, that another conductor, who belonged to the party, I, I believe he joined twice, has already been cleared. He's working. But I must wait and wait and wait. I have no idea who he is. It's not my case. But uh, why is it, please? That I, had, I had it on very good authority that certain high-ranking Nazi scientists are, even as we speak, being transported to the United States to work on missiles and rocket fuels. Mm, it spoils the war, well, different professions, different rules. <laughs> Why did you escape to Switzerland in January of last year? What? Why did you escape to Switzerland last year? Because I heard that I was going to be arrested by the Gestapo. Why were they going to arrest you? the entire reception. I think it was probably because of another letter that I had written to Gerbos lamenting the decline in musical standards due to racial policy. So you didn't, you didn't complain about the racial policies, just the decline in musical standards, is that right? How did you learn that the stop all was out to get you? Yeah. It was during an enforced hour long interval. It was a power thing, yeah. The concert in Brutal Hall here in that meeting. <coughs> Albert Speer, the Minister of Armaments, said to me casually, You look very tired, I'm so you should go abroad for a while. Yeah, well, I knew exactly what he meant. Is that the same Albert Speer who was sitting in the dock at Nuremberg alongside your other friend Balder, also charged with crimes against humanity? I'm sure knew a lot of people in high places, Willem. Well, it would be true to say that a lot of people in high places knew me. Don't get smart with you. I think your friends are nothing but a bunch of criminal shitheads. But you know, and I know, that you made a deal. <laughs> Make a phone call and Jew is saved. Write a nasty letter and Albert says leave town. Well, let's come clean then, Will. Not to get out here. What was your party number? If you were going to bully me, Major, you would better do your homework. You have no idea how stupid and impertinent your remarks are. David, when I said I had one question I was going to ask Will, and he's going to find it impossible to answer, I'm going to ask that now, David. But you take your time, okay? Because this is real tough. Why didn't you get out? In 1933, right at the start, when Hitler came to power, I'm cutting names here, the people in your line of business who did get out, Bruno Walter, Otto Klipper, but they were Jews, they had to leave, they were right to leave. I love my country and my people. It is a matter of body and soul. I could not leave my country in the deepest sorrow. Uh, to have left in 1933 or 34 would have been shameful. I remained here to give comfort, to see 
that the glorious musical tradition of which I felt I was one of the guardians remained unbroken and was intact when we awoke from this nightmare. I remained because I believed that my promise was with my people. See, David, told you couldn't answer. I'm going to ask it again, and this time no more airy-fairy bullshit. I have already given you my reasons, Major. I only hope that we're as hard on, on other authors to decide to remain in that context. She chose for college. Prokofiev, Eisenstein, yes, especially Eisenstein and his films glorifying tyranny. Now you can say that they all are guilty of glorifying tyranny. I have no idea who they are. I mean, they're, they're not my cases. They're not on any of my lips. No, they're Russians. Russians. Major Arnold's office. It's Major Richards for Lieutenant Wills. Wills? Yep. You want me to tell him? Yes. Major Richards wants more. Well, I've had enough. Yes. I'm leaving now. Arnold, I don't think that would be advisable. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Dr. When I was young, my father, who was a publisher, allowed me to accompany him on a business trip to Berlin. On the second night of our visit, he took me to the Philharmonic. I don't remember the whole program, but I do remember you conducting both Beethoven's Egmont Overture and the Symphony. I think the concert ended with Overture to the Townhouse. You opened a new world to me. More than a world, like waking from a sleep, a, ch a child waking to a new world. <laughs> you showed me a place where there was an absence of misery. Ever since I first heard you, Music has been central to my life, my chief comfort, and I needed comfort. I thank you for that. <laughs> I too. <coughs> the same. Don't get shy. Fräulein. Strobel. Then I'm in the soon as the Mauerland's dirigent of that. Here in Berlin. Uh -huh. David. Gotta hand it to the British. You know what they are? Decent. Well, you know Hans Hinkel? Well, Hans Hinkel. Why does everybody repeat my question? Do I know Hans Hinkel? There it goes again. <laughs> yes, of course I know Hans Hinkel. That human being beneath the tent. I ask you no all. It was Hinkel who personally drove him out. Do you know what his job was in the Ministry of Culture? Getting rid of Jews in the arts. And since the most talented artists were inevitably Jewish, he was sent to my book. I could detain it for you the persecutions he made of, of my personal secretary, Bertha Geisler, herself a Jewess. Only I will not bore you with a chronicle of cruelty and meanness and audacity. Sounds like the same guy. But you know what else this little creep did? He kept files, close on to 250,000 files. You know what's in those files? But well, how should I go back? You're going to love this. <laughs> those files, those files contain records. Records of every artist working in this country for, yeah, Big Three, Adolf Hunter and Joseph. And those records are going to tell us who all of you joined the party and and who informed and who helped who and oh, and they're just full of love letters swearing everlasting loyalty to your to your aforementioned pals. There. Yeah, you believe that a file in your way against some guy that angle. <laughs> I should like to leave now. Yeah, I'll bet you would. So why don't I? Okay. I mean, we got we got a lot of work to do. You know, sifting through all those files and stuff. And that's going to take some time. So you go ahead and get on out of here. Call you back when we're good and ready.
got it. Did you see? Did you see how the minute I mentioned Hinkle, he wanted out of here? Oh man. Okay. Here's what we need to do. Emmy, we need to get David to listen to the witnesses and get us some more coffee. David, this is what I want you to do. These are pretty much for babies, all of the ones that I've talked to. All right. Now we're going to take the information the shit that gave me in here and compare it to what we get from Hinkle's files. This this is an Aladdin's cave. And when you think you think. The Russians had the entire archive in, in their hands until the city was divided. They didn't even know what it was. You know what they're doing now? Shitting razor blades, that's what. <laughs>
Major, you must not miss what I'm holding in my hat. Your dick. Oh, come. Yes. Uh, you like guessing games? Love them. All right, I'm gonna give up. What are you holding in your hand? No, from a stroke? No. Because I wanted to see you alone tonight, Helma. Off the record. So, what do you got? You can't guess? Come up, I think I know what it is. A lot. Telescope for spying on people, right? No. No, not at all. Hi, Jiminy, a white stick. No, Major. <laughs> not a white stick. A baton. A conductor's baton. And not just a baton, but a D baton. <laughs> My guilty secrets. The Maestro's baton, which I stole. Morning kept in his right hand, huh? You remember? How could I forget? Look at that. I'm holding the baton that he had to keep in his right hand so he wouldn't have to salute and poke off sides out. Show me how it's done. I'll show you? Yeah, come on, come on, take the baton. Show me how it's done. All right, here. Pretend I'm eight off. Okay, you're the maestro. <laughs> You've got the baton in your right hand, but you give me the salute anyway, okay? Come on, Major. I don't like giving the salute, even in jest. I don't want oh, hell with Come on. Do it right, Helm. Oh! You look good doing that, Helma. See what you mean? You almost poked my eyes out. Exactly. Would you do me a favor, Major? If you'll be seeing the Maestro, would you be so good as to return the baton to him? It is, after all, his property. Please don't tell him who stole it. Don't worry, Helm, it will be our little secret. In the meantime, you can practice your conducting. <laughs> oh. I saw you have some of our records. I love this one, uh, the ninth uh, second bill. It, it is difficult to identify me exactly. You're working late tonight. Uh, you don't often see people work this late. All in the cause of humanity, Helmuth. Should I say 1049331? Ah. One zero four nine three three one. Or, do you mind if I just call you one? You know what I say you are, Helen? I say you're a piece of shit. The bastard! The bastard! Who's the bastard, Helen? Engel? Why? No. Why? Particularly. He said that there'd be no fire, no wreck. You pull your fire. <laughs> and you thought we wouldn't find out? <laughs> But you thought we wouldn't find out that you were the party's man in the orchestra <laughs> people's name? Oh, come on, Helmuth, don't take on some. You've only got one party member. Some guy named Herbie Von Kerrigan's got two. Why do you think he did that? Join the party twice, once here and once in Austria? I guess he just wanted to show him here. <laughs> well, come on, party member, party member 1049331. Talk to me. 
I have been given that solution. The capacity of sinners. Don't you guys have to do penance? What's your penance, Helen? Living out the rest of my life. Oh, hold it. Your story moves me deeply. I'm so choked up I can hardly speak. Let me wipe away the tears. You told me no one was like to wake up to a power so terrifying, so immense. All you can think of is that you'll have to be a part of it or you'll be eaten alive. There's something else you don't understand. Absolute power offers absolute certainty and absolute hope. Doesn't matter if I understand it or not. Why don't you just get it off the chest? Slice deeply how corrupt the power was. Corrupt. Corrupting. Never experienced a, a reign of terror. How can I make it clear to you? I censor what you say. And I censor what you think. And finally, you censor what you feel. That is the greatest degradation of all. Because it means the entire individual will is paralyzed. All that remains is an obedient husk. In my case. Go on, help in your case. It began with a realization. So what was that? So I'm not the best I do is to do You're not. And if in my mind was to be would never have thought to be even the second violinist in the Berlin Philharmonic, but when they got me to the... They can see people like me. I, I taught that to be just so. I, I can trace my ancestry back to the 13th century. Heard some Jews can trace theirs back even further. I lied about something. It surprised me, no, but no, no, I, I want to set the record straight. I told you it was my idea that the master should come out of the town with his right hand. It was not my idea at all. The idea was Franz Jostrom. He was the officer's hand. That kind of changes the picture, no? I don't think the maestro even knows of my existence. So. Second violin. Second violin. You see, the conductor is also a dictator. He is also a terrifying power of office. Open certainty and guarantees order. Yeah, but the yeah. office was a symbol. Okay, please, please. No, no, no more philosophy, all right? I want to talk about something practical. You ever heard of plea bargaining? We talk about power. <laughs> I got the power to let you go find work, at least in the American zone. I could get you a job tomorrow, right here in this building. But I gotta have something in return. See, that's plea bargaining. I gotta admit, didn't I find a nice big fat file on the maestro? Never mind two party numbers, you got four. So I've got some letters after Joseph to help this Jew and that Jew. Yes, to say there's not a Jew left in Germany whom Ferdinand had not had. Yeah, well, come on. Then. Okay? I can hand you a letter. I can hand you a letter tomorrow giving you freedom of movement, freedom to work, freedom, Helmut. Better than scavenging for food in the ruins. So I gotta have something in return. Yeah. That he is an anti Semite, of course. Of course. Hard facts. Don't think I tell me where to look. Hard facts. 
nature. Who are you talking about the man of genius here? Perhaps if we just fuck that out. helmet, okay? You want to discuss symbols here? The guy was a front man. He was a piper, but he played their tune. You get my philosophical meaning? I'm not interested in small fish, Tom. I want big dick. You gotta tell me where to look and what to look for. Hard facts. You ever hear the toy of this about? No. Tag in. said something like, it is impudent for that juice of butter to conduct brass. It doesn't knock me out. It's a letter. Now I'm hearing music. I like letters. It must be the fire of summer to minister of culture to the roots, I think. Uh, full of the sort of thing you're looking for about how much stronger uh, a jewel. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, Composer, modern. Yeah, what he was the date of the letter. Uh, that came before the war. <clears throat> There's something else I just remembered. Yeah. Looks like you sent him a birthday telegram. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oddly enough, I got this from one of your people. One of my people? Oh, okay. The U.S. Army, a uh, Jew. He said he saw the telegram in the chancery. Not again. But we'll find the corporal and we'll find the telegram. I don't remember his name. I think I remember. Yeah. Sure, I This is what I want you to do, Helen. I want you to write all that down. Okay? And I want you to keep this in mind. That I know. <laughs> I know that a deal was made early on. And they said, well, you don't have to join the party. As long as you do as we tell you, you're not going to have to worry about a goddamn thing. And that's why you never left. I need documentary proof. Now, do you know of anything like that? No, Major. And if I may say so, I, I think they're barking up the wrong tree. Okay, then what's the right tree, you know? There's a pattern to his behavior. The was understood it. I don't know if it's true or not, but, but ask him about Van der Leer. Well, I, I never heard of him. Who is he? Uh, Edwin Van der Leer, a, a, a music critic. Well, he gave Fred Wagner a terrible review, uh, raving about Herbert Van Kerrien, uh, uh, the two-time party member. Called him the miracle of Van Kerrien. Fred Wagner was outraged, uh, and they say he had Van der Leer conscripted into the army. Same thing happened with, with another pretty excellent. Walter Steinhardt. He savaged the Wagner in print uh, for not playing more contemporary music. Uh, after that review appeared, he too was conscripted. So, you are not, it is not such a bad idea. If you give you a bad review, you have no such with a Russian concept. <laughs> if you want to get the Wagner, Ask him about the other Van Kerr. It's uh this miracle. Ask him about Van Kerr. I think you will find that he not, cannot even bring himself to other to name. Third Wrangler refers to him as K. And ask him about his private life. His private life?
fantastic preacher. <coughs> so well. The British were most helpful. They really have a broadcasting station there and they found it for me to no more than 10 minutes. Amazing. And I'm so pleased you are becoming interested in serious music, Major. Don't want one record for you. You brought the seventh symphony. That's difficult even on me. Should we play it now? No. No, you know the uh, part that's uh, called the slow movement? Of course. Okay, that's what I want to hear. Put it on ready to play and I'll tell you when to play. I never thought you'd ask to listen to Bergman. Maybe I'm mellow. Maybe this heat's getting to me. Jesus, but you know, we shiver through a god awful winter, and now the central heating's working in the sunshine. <laughs> Military god. No news from the band leader? I wish you'd call him Dr. Footballer. No, he isn't here yet, but then it's not yet 9 o'clock. Are you nervous, Major? I wish you'd call me Steve, Emmy. No, I'm not nervous. I'm not getting enough sleep. Bad dreams. That's what I'm awake. Emmy. You don't want to be here this afternoon when I talk to him, and that's okay, because I'm probably going to say some things that might upset you. God knows work for me, you get upset enough. What are you going to say to him, Major? Go for a walk, Emmy. Okay? Take, take a, it's a lovely day. Just, just take a stroll in the tear garden. Go, go sit underneath what's left of the linden trees. David can take notes, all right? Major, you upset me when you avoid answering my questions. You see who it is, Emmy. It's the band leader. I'll let him in yet. Can oh. Security! Be careful, Emmy. He may want to frisk you. Major, a woman left this way. A woman. I don't know her name. She talked to Sergeant Adams on the door, he gave me just a said I should to you. Did you see her? Of course, I was standing here, Sergeant Adams was there. She was only just What does she look like? Short, tall, thin, fat, what? Old, young, fat? No. Very funny, Elmer. What's in the bag? I don't know. Maybe Sergeant Adams should I said I should give it to you. Jesus Christ, Elmer. You're supposed to be security in this building. But I was told not to inspect bags addressed to military personnel. Uh -huh. Security, Thelma, use your goddamn common sense. Huh? Sergeant Adams said I should search people. He did not say I should search bags. Thelma, it's no wonder you were a second violinist. <laughs> Doesn't it stand the reason that a strange woman leaves a bag for me? You've got to be curious as to what's in it. Why should I be curious? It's addressed to you, Major. <laughs> be a fucking bomb, Thelma. <laughs> oh, think so? Yeah, I think so. Open it, Helen. That's an order. Open it, Helen. The major. If it's a bomb, shouldn't you take that up? Open it, Helen. Oh. Feel around inside. Around. Feels like papers, Major. <laughs> Empty. On the floor, Helmut. What the hell is that? Perhaps it's fan mail.